people concerned about age. How does the president plan to convince the American people over the next year that 80 is not too old for someone who's running for re-election? 80 is the new 40. Did you hear? Uh It's Monday, September 18th, 2023. I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report. We are live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and locals. Share, tap that notification bell so you have at least a slim chance of seeing our videos. Uh, we've got a post-game wrap-up at rubinreport.locals.com, as always, and uh, a bit of a, a personal note uh, before we do today's show, before I give you the full rundown on what we're doing today. Uh, you know, usually when I wake up in the morning and we're ready to put together a show and Phoenix and I are texting back and forth on how we want to craft the show today and what the arc is going to look like and the story that we're going to tell you, um, you know, we're going through current events. Oh, this person said that. Some lunatic on The View said this. MSNBC, Trump, Biden. Ah. Uh, today's show is going to be focused around uh, what's going on with Russell Brand. I, I consider Russell Brand a friend. Uh, we've only met in person I think really just the one time that I had him in studio in Miami, uh, just, what was that, four or five months ago. Uh, obviously, we've chatted a bunch of other times. Uh, I helped him get on board with uh, Rumble and Locals and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the machine is really going after him right now. It is my hope that although I'm going to cover it today, uh, that enough of you will know the games of the machine because we've talked about this for so long, the smoke screen and the confusion that the machine throws at everybody, where they try to make it seem like the good guys are the bad guys and the bad guys are the good guys and everything else. So I kind of didn't want to discuss this at all because these allegations uh, against Russell, my guess are complete nonsense or at least within the, within the historical context of them happening, probably have no real value. But what this is really about, I just have no doubt, even if he at one point did something that he shouldn't have done, what this is about more than anything else is that if you tell the truth, they will come after you. And that is a, that is a very scary premise. Uh, I like to believe that I'm one of the people that's telling you the truth. And it's like, they come after everybody. So we are gonna cover it. I hope we never have to cover it again. I kinda wanna just address it once so we can just put it to bed and then we'll watch the people that lie about everything continue to lie about it. Uh, but I thought it was important just to say that at the beginning because I, I don't want this story of a guy who I think has done some really good stuff. We talk about him quite often on this show. Uh, some really good stuff over the last couple of years and has had a really interesting political evolution and who has called out the people who deserve to be called out. Well, now the machine's coming to hit him and I don't want to feed that monster. I simply do not want to do it. So yes, the, the theme of the show, jumping off with Russell, is how the mainstream media treats their opponents versus how they treat their lackeys. And hint, uh, yes, it is very, very different. Uh, but it does seem that some people who kind of get it sometimes, say a Bill Maher or even a Donald Trump, uh, they kind of get it sometimes and they rail against the machine. They always go back to salvating over the machine when push comes to shove. So uh, that is the theme for today's show. Before we get to it, let's talk about Moinkbox and then we'll dive deep on all of that. Uh, you guys know that 60% of US pork production comes from one company owned by the Chinese, and their hogs are given something called ractopamine, which is banned in 160 countries, including China, yet you find it in your grocery aisle every day. Guys, there's a better way, which is why I wanna tell you about Moink. You know it is moo plus oink. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should because the family farm just does it better. The Moink difference is a difference you can taste and you can feel good knowing you're helping family farms stay financially independent as well. You choose the meat it delivered in every box, like ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops to salmon fillets and much more. Plus, you can cancel any time. Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary called Moink's bacon the best bacon he's ever tasted. And you know that they say, you'll, they say you'll say oink oink, I'm just so happy I got Moink. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash Ruben right now. And listeners of this show get free ground beef for a year. That's one of the best ground beef you'll ever taste. But for a limited time, moinkbox.com slash Ruben, moinkbox.com slash Ruben. And now back to me. Okay, so look, Russell Brand is under attack from the machine. The London Times has been working on an expose 
uh, against him for a long time now, and he got some early advance warning that it was coming out. Uh, Russell did the right thing, was which was address it right out of the gate. Here is a portion of that, and then that'll kind of set up the rest of today's show. Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Now, this isn't the usual type of video we make on this channel where we critique, attack, and undermine the news in all its corruption, because in this story, I am the news. I've received two extremely disturbing letters, or a letter and an email, one from a mainstream media TV company, one from a newspaper listing a litany of extremely egregious and aggressive attacks, as well as some pretty stupid stuff, like uh, my community festival should be stopped, that I shouldn't be able to attack mainstream media narratives on this channel. But amidst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. And to see that transparency metastasized into something criminal that I absolutely deny makes me question is there another agenda at play? Particularly when we've seen coordinated media attacks before, like with Joe Rogan, when he dared to take a medicine that the mainstream media didn't approve of. And we saw a spate of headlines from media outlets across the world using the same language. I'm aware that you guys have been saying in the comments for a while, watch out, Russell, they're coming for you. You're getting too close to the truth. Russell Brand did not kill himself. It's been clear to me, or at least it feels to me like there's a serious and concerted agenda to control these kind of spaces and these kind of voices. And I mean my voice along with your voice. Also, it's worth mentioning that there are witnesses whose evidence directly contradicts the narratives that these two mainstream media outlets are trying to construct, apparently in what seems to me to be a coordinated attack. There's a lot to unpack here. And as I said, this gives me no pleasure. And my hope is, and my intention is that after today, I will not address this story again, because what I'm trying to do by addressing it today uh, is I don't want more attention on this nonsense and what the London Times is trying to do to Russell Brand. I want enough of you, hopefully, to understand the way the machine works. He's laying it out there quite, quite clearly. And then if we don't give it the attention, if we don't give it the clicks, and the coverage that it wants, although I'll show you the type of coverage that it's getting right now, that maybe it will kind of go away. Russell, for many years, has been very actually outspoken about some of his previous behaviors and being promiscuous and banging a lot of chicks and going out to clubs. He's written about it. He's talked about it on podcasts. He's now happily married. He just had, I think, his second child about two months ago. Um, he has changed. I want to know if any of you watching this right now were you different in your 20s? Did you have a lot of sex or do a lot of drugs or whatever it might be? He is making it very clear he did not rape anyone or assault anyone or anything like that. But again, that's all a sideshow. That's all a sideshow because there's only one reason that they're doing this with him. If Russell Brand was still the same Russell Brand of seven years ago, who was in a couple movies and doing some stand-up specials about whatever it might be, they'd never be going after him. I don't even know that I, what movies was he in? I don't even know that I, he got, get him to the Greek, never saw it. What, what other stuff was he in? I never really knew of Russell Brand. I knew he was a British kind of over the top comedian uh, years ago. He evolved into something else. But my point is if he was still the Russell Brand of seven years ago, they would never be going after him, right? But now I wanna show you what this is really, about, what this is really about. And obviously I don't have every insight into every little thing he did okay, or didn't do. But the point is the fact that I even have to say that already shows you how they start making you look at people who don't deserve to be looked at, so you don't look at the actual people who should be looked at, right? We've seen this again and again, whether it was Joe Rogan during COVID, right? Or whether it was Jordan Peterson from page of the New York Times, uh, that Jordan Peterson was for enforced monogamy, which made it sound like he wanted women to be in the hands made tale. Whether it was the front page of the New York Times when they put me and Ben Shapiro and Thomas Sowell and Milton Friedman as the leaders of the alt-right. I mean, they've done this time and again, and the point of discussing it is so that you don't fall for it again. But look what they are doing. This is from Ian Miles Chong on Twitter. He found this video of just what the front page of the papers in England look right now, look like right now. It's about that he raped me and all, all of this stuff. It hid in plain sight. Like he is now the enemy of the people. And there is nothing worse. For as bad as our mainstream media is, there is almost nothing worse 
than a British tabloid. Uh, if you want to know a bit about that, I would recommend you watch uh, The Crown on Netflix and see what they did. Um, I mean, it's just to, to Diana and the, and the rest of it, that's a little bit of a sidebar, but they've been doing this forever. And if Russell was not always attacking mainstream, they would not be putting him all over the covers. By the way, he also addressed this. Uh, when they put this together, this, this attack piece on him on what he's done, several girls then reached, put out public videos saying that they reached out to me, but because I said he treated me with respect and it was totally consensual and everything else, they decided not to include them in the articles. This is what they do with everything, with everything, absolutely everything, guys. So again, why are they looking at Russell Brand? Do you think it might be because he's been looking at them? Out of respect for you and your show, <laughs> I've brought some facts. Mm. Would you? <laughs> If you like, oh, they're oh. actually... Well, you, just, you just get the fuck no, no. out of here. This thought, is not the place. No, I thought you like facts. No, no, I, we do. No, we like but, facts. I love facts. I wouldn't have mentioned it. I'm English, and you know that politeness is our fundamental religion. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they do pertain to this issue, so may I say something? Please, please, if they please inconvenience do. you, I see, I... I'll stop saying them. The pandemic created at least 40 new far big pharma billionaires. Pharmaceutical corporations like Moderna and Pfizer made $1,000 of profit every second from the COVID-19 <laughs> vaccine. More than well. two-thirds of Congress was received campaign funding from pharmaceutical companies in the 2020 election. Pfizer chairman Albert Baller told Time magazine in July 2020 that his company was developing a COVID vaccine for the good of humanity, not for money. And of course, Pfizer made a hundred billion dollars okay. in profit right. in 2022. Right. And may I just mention that finally, and these are, this is also a fact, that you, the American public, funded the development of that. The German fund, public funded the BioNTech vaccine. When it came to the profits, they took the profits. When it came to the funding you paid for the funding all i'm querying is this yes is if you have right. an economic system in which pharmaceutical companies benefit hugely from medical emergencies where a military industrial okay. complex benefits from war where energy companies benefit from energy crises you are going to These generate right. states of perpetual crisis yes. where the interests of ordinary and, and, people well, yes. and, separate from the interests of the elite and, I find it very bizarre that they're going after Russell Brand right now with allegations from a decade ago and ignoring people who go against those allegations. Do you think it's weird? Do you think it has something to do with some of this? Now, what's interesting is it does seem to me, and again, why I'm really trying, gonna do my best not to cover this going forward after today, uh, that it doesn't seem to be latching on the way it has. We've been living through the last, what, five years of cancel culture and random people being destroyed and, oh, that comedian said that seven years ago and everything else. And we watch Roseanne Barr, who had the number one sitcom in America, get canceled uh, for a joke. Like, it's all so stupid and ridiculous and we've all so seen it at this point. We've looked behind that curtain and seen that it's just a little man there and not the all-powerful Oz that it does seem like perhaps this is the one that isn't quite going to work. Now, I always grant the machine you know, the, the credit that it deserves and that it's always a step ahead. So who knows? But Elon Musk has come out in support of Russell Brand. Jordan Peterson has come out in, in support of Russell Brand. Joe Rogan has come out in support of Russell Brand. The people kind of see the difference in this one. And, and I just hope more and more people will. It has way more to do with his beliefs and what he's been doing for a living than anything that he might have done in back in his days. And again, every, every single one of us, me, every single one of you watching this, everyone regrets a, a, an affair they had, this, that, the other thing. You know what I mean? Like everyone made mistakes in their life. Everyone was too promiscuous. Everyone drank too much or smoked too much or did whatever God knows what they did, right? And if you want to destroy everybody for their past, then no one will ever have a future. It is as simple as that. Now I want to throw to a video of Russell in 2019. So this is four years ago when he was just beginning to question some of the stuff that led him to becoming the Russell brand that we now know provide alternative narratives and not only provide the narratives, invite you to create the narratives with us. Because do you know one thing I know? I don't know what's best. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've been wrong many times, but I'm beginning to think I'm right about this. The mainstream media is not your friend. The culture is not your friend. The government is not your friend. Big business is not your friend. Okay, so that was the beginning of his evolution and he went and went and went and went and now how is the machine hitting back? Just like that week, you all remember it. 
at the height of COVID and everything else, when Joe Rogan was questioning all of the things related to COVID and why can't we use Regeneron and why do we have to be vaxxed? And then what happened? The machine out of nowhere for a week, everybody on CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, Joe Rogan's a racist. Look at all the times he said the N-word, even though he never said the N-word to, to in a pejorative manner. He never said it to be racist. He was mocking people who use it that way, but they've done this time and again. If I was to show you how many mainstream hit pieces on me, Dave Rubin, leader of the alt-right, racist Dave Rubin, he platforms these people, he's dangerous, and they do it to try to scare the F out of you, meaning me and these types of people in this case, but it's really to scare the F you. We will continue with this theme after I tell you about Patriot Supply. Uh, do you get the feeling that something's gonna happen, bad is gonna happen soon? That's a hell of a segue right there. I do, but between the distractions and smoke screens in the media, we probably won't see it coming. That's why it's smart to invest in emergency food right now. As they say, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. My Patriot Supply is the nation's leader in high quality emergency food. Head over to my website, preparewithruben.com. You'll save 200 bucks on your three month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. Enjoy a wide variety of delicious meals offering over 2000 calories every day for optimum strength under stress. Stock up before panic sets in. Free shipping is automatic and your order ships fast. Go to preparewithruben.com, preparewithruben.com. And now back to me. Okay, so the other story of the last couple of days, and we're gonna link all of this and bring it around to Russell at the end, uh, was uh, that Lauren Boebert, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who I've had on the show, I've enjoyed spending time with her. I think she's been a good fighter for conservative principles. Uh, she went to Beetlejuice, the musical, and someone squeezed her boob. And uh, well, here's the headline from Politico on that one. Bobert caught on video apologizes for inappropriate behavior at Beetlejuice show. Okay, so we're not gonna show you, but somehow using like video that you can see in the dark, uh, she went on a date, she's in the middle of a divorce, she went on a date with this guy, she also vaped in the theater, I guess you're not allowed to vape in the theater, so she vaped, the guy grabbed her boob, looks like she kinda grabbed his crotch, this was done in the dark, I'm not defending any of it, but can we put that headline up again, I just wanna show you, that this is the point. Here's the political headline on what she did. And again, she got her, people like squeeze, put, put the camera back on me for a second. I'm here with three heterosexual men. You all like squeezing a boob every now and again, right? This is something you enjoy. Connor was like, yep. I do, I do. Phoenix, you like, uh, you like the boob, you got no problem. Brock, not into the boob. Brock, Brock doesn't care for the boob. Do we have to tell your fiance that? That's gonna be a problem. <laughs> anyway, the point is, all right, she got her boob squeezed. She grabbed his nuts, who cares? But look at the headline on this one. Again, now put the headline up. Bobert caught on video apologizes for inappropriate behavior at Beetlejuice show. Now, let's go to Politico just two or three days earlier because you may have heard this story. There is a Virginia state senator, she's a Democrat, by the name of Susanna Gibson. She was on a website called uh, chatterbait.com. Don't go there right now, please, especially if you're at work. Uh, and she was doing sex acts with her husband. Okay, I don't know if you know this, guys. There's porn online. People watch it. Okay, zippity doo -dah. But it got exposed. Now, it, it's not exposed is not even the right word. She was doing this publicly. It was on a public website. But look at the headline on Politico. So what if a candidate live streams sex acts with their husband? So when it's a Democrat, who cares if she's getting banged by her husband and sticking a lamp up her hoo-ha and everything else? She's a Democrat, who cares? But if Lauren Boebert gets her boob squeezed, and again, I'm not even equivocating these things or anything else. What I'm trying to show you, of course, is the double standard of all of these things. And by the way, to some extent, there, there should be a double standard in that conservatives have some set of principles and Democrats generally don't have principles, right? So if, if Lauren, um, you know, if she puts herself up there as a Christian conservative or whatever it might be, maybe she shouldn't be getting her boob squeezed and grabbing the guy's nuts. That's fine. What I'm trying to show you here is the way the media, if you're a Republican, it's naughty and inappropriate. And if you're a Democrat and you're getting banged on a webcam, yes, you should be a state senator. And if anyone calls you, you know, you're a bad girl for that, you should be in a lot of trouble. Uh, anyway, on CNN, they covered it, uh, the Boebert thing, and uh, well, they just laughed about it. Well, let me, uh, speaking of ushering, let me uh, talk to, uh, to both of you about Colorado uh, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. Uh, she, <laughs> She was uh, booted from Beetlejuice. Uh, that, and <laughs> it's mostly because no one's grabbed either one of their boobs in a long time, but they think it's hilarious that someone's boob got grabbed. 
It was less funny to uh, the people of CNN when Jeffrey Tubin came back after he was caught masturbating on a Zoom call. Um, in October, you were on a Zoom call with your colleagues from the New Yorker magazine. Everyone took a break for several minutes, during which time you were caught masturbating on camera. Uh, you were subsequently fired from that job after 27 years of working there. And you, since then, have been on leave from CNN. Do I have all that right? Um, you got it all right, sad to say. OK, so let's start there. Okay. Um, to quote Jay Leno, what the hell were you thinking? Well, obviously, uh, I wasn't thinking very well or very much. And um, it was something that was inexplicable to me. I think one point, I, I wouldn't exactly say in my defense, because nothing is really in my defense. I didn't think I was on the call. I didn't think other people could see me. You know what we should have done? We would have been demonetized, but we should have had the camera come back to me, and I, I should have been masturbating. I know it did. No. <laughs> Well, wow, they all just handed in their resignation, right? You, all three of you were like, we've been waiting, Dave. We, um, you get the point, guys. People do these things and then they frame it. If you're a good guy and a Democrat and a lefty, you get framed one way and we'll give you the job back and everything else. If you're a Republican, we gotta cancel you because you got your boob squeezed. If you're Russell Brand, now they're trying to also frame Russell Brand as some crazy right-wing maniac. Russell Brand, who I'm pretty sure is supporting lefty lunatic Cornell West, for president who had Noam Chomsky on a couple weeks ago, who still, I think, is, uh, let's say, confused a little bit about some of the political issues of the day. And by the way, I discussed that with him in my interview. Anyway, you see the double standard and all that, but now let's shift a little bit because there is something interesting happening in the media right now related to the lies and how much the system can control the lies at once. So ABC's John Carl went on uh, The View we are gonna show you a clip of The View. We actually have two clips of The View. No, I think we have three clips. Jesus, we have three clips of The View. What am I doing with my life? We have three clips of The View. But a ABC's John Carl went on The View. Now, funny thing about John Carl, I don't, this, I'm gonna get the numbers off slightly, but when Don't Burn This Book came out, uh, we should have been number two on the New York Times bestseller. And the sales numbers are very obvious because it's sales, so they can't fake it. Like the sales numbers come through, but then the New York Times just rejiggers their list however they see fit. Jonathan, I think I sold like 40,000 copies first week or something. Jonathan Carl sold like 4,000 copies. I'm pretty sure they put him at number four and they put me at number 11. I only mention that to say, this is a guy who's in it with the system. He's the machine, he feeds the machine what it wants and the machine spits back you know, the stuff for him. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, he went on The View talking about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden corruption and Burisma and all of that, and they, they kind of make sense here. This is weird, and this shows you that the system is not impervious. Watch this, it, this is gonna blow your mind. Like there's a, even Anna Navarro, I'm, I'm leading too much, just watch. Pride. It, 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 it has an appearance of impropriety. As a matter of fact, this is a little piece of personal trivia. I believe I am the only White House reporter who asked about Hunter Biden and Burisma during the Obama administration. Yeah. Because as soon as that deal was announced that he was going on the board of Burisma, he was gonna be paid about $50,000 a month. I, yeah. I went and I asked Jay Carney, who was then the White House press secretary, I said, Doesn't, isn't, you know, his father is the vice president and he's in charge of Ukraine policy. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, isn't that at the very least unseemly? It may not be illegal, but I mean, come what on. What did Jay say? So, so he said, well, you know, the, this, he gave me basically a non-answer saying that, 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 the, that the vice president had nothing to do with this. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, Hunter Biden's going to do what Hunter Biden's going to do. It, and, it got re, and it got reviewed by the State Department, didn't it? Yeah. And, and approved, which I think it shouldn't have. I mean, I mean, look, it, 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 you can say this looks like what, like sleazy, it doesn't look right. But the question is, is there anything illegal? Mm -hmm. And is there any evidence whatsoever that Joe Biden actually took part in this and profited? And, is, and, and there is, and there is, is none. Is this a Okay, I am telling you, mark my words, they are getting rid of Joe Biden. And the fact that ABC News just put on one of their main guys, right, to go on The View to discuss that. Why else would you put him on? They're trying to show you that something is there so that he will step down. Again, he's not going to be impeached because they don't have the Senate, but they're trying to show him the door. Otherwise, it makes, why would you bring on, you have to understand these are highly produced shows. They pick when they are gonna have someone on and exactly what they are gonna say. He knows, and the producers know what he's gonna say there. So he says, and ah, he's like, look at me. I was one of the first guys to say that there was something, there was something going on here. And Jay Carney, who was the press secretary at the time, he was the cringe Jean-Pierre of his day. He just kind of blew it off, but obviously something was there. And then even freaking Anna Navarro, 
when they're like, oh, they passed it through the State Department, the State Department said it was fine, meaning that Hunter had this job and Joe was the vice president and it made no sense because he was a crack addict and why should a crack addict be working at a Ukrainian energy company? Even Anna Navarro's like, that shouldn't have happened. So they're admitting the view just platformed and a newsman to say something's rotten in stink town and then they agreed with it. They agreed with it. I, okay, but now let's go back to uh, the crazy portion of the view because it's almost like someone coming out of a coma for just a second. They came out of the coma, they were sane for a second, now they go into their coma stupor. Uh, here's Anna Navarro on guns. I was reading today, I, I, he was one of the kids who was in the car when the, yeah. a sibling yes. and his when mother were killed. Mother died. Joe Biden's this. first wife and child. He was traumatized by that. He probably has a lot yeah. of survivor guilt and all that. And then his brother. He, need, he needs therapy. That but his brother as, has yeah. as one of the 80% of brother. Republicans who do support background checks, this is an example of background checks working. An addict should not be able to get it in a gun. Own. And the fact, I do think that he, I, how he's, you know, what the conviction ends up being, that remains to be seen. I do think he should be indicted on this. I don't think you should have addicts who are easily able. Well, what this about? is the only time Republicans don't want somebody to have a gun. Well, that, well, I know. Well, I, I, was, that I, was, yeah. I was just about to say that. I mean, all of a sudden, this should be indicted, yet you have states where you can open carry without even applying for it. Nah, 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 nah. It's the only time Republicans don't want people to have guns. Well, you know, we do have the Second Amendment. We're allowed to have guns. Okay, just to be clear, no state in the union Back check me on this one, Media Matters. No state in the union has no background check. There is a federal background check. Then some states have extra laws. It's obviously harder to get a gun in a place like California. And then you know what happens in the cities in California? They're very violent because good people have a harder time getting a gun. Actually, one of the one of the true like, oh my God, does my does my politics, do my politics match my reality moments? was that at the height of COVID when we were having the summer of love and they were burning down LA and the ramp rampaging through the city and riots were literally going by my house and people knew where I lived and we decided, well, we got Clyde. Uh, Emma had just passed away our previous dog. One thing, if you get a dog, you know that if you get a dog, you have something like 90% less chance of your house being broken into because people just, you know, they case your house and they, they just don't wanna deal with the dog. So we got Clyde, that was one thing. Although I mostly got Clyde because they were just killing dogs in the name of COVID because they were going to just kill, they were literally just going to kill them because they didn't want people working at shelters. So I just grabbed him and saved him. Anyway, we got Clyde and then we got a couple guns and, and I cannot tell you if I named them, they would kill me. My, the amount of my liberal celebrity friends in Hollywood who were asking me where I got my guns and how they could get guns. So Alyssa Farah is completely lying. You cannot be an addict and get a gun without a, without a background check. Yes, there's illegal ways to get guns, but we already have laws for these things. So again, the view had a moment of sanity and clarity, and then they go right back to their lying and pandering and nonsense. But now just one more from the view, because uh, this one just came out of nowhere. This is from Friday's view. And I just, I was just like, what in the world is this? And well, take a look. Disregard for people. Are you pregnant? No. Oh my God. Yes, I just got a. I, Did you get the glow? I got. I just Please got a vibe. Please tummy. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It was fine. just. It, it um, was can we take bets? Fairy? Can we take bets at the table? Oh. What is going on with these women? I'm pretty sure Whoopi's uh, pregnant with quintuplets, but. Uh, but People wake up and watch that program. It's on right now. It's wild. Anyway, I don't know what the hell's going on over there. Uh, but the point is, the point of all of that really was the first clip. That that's something weird. There's there's something weird in the ether right now. That the system is now allowing people to acknowledge what a whole bunch of us were acknowledging four or five years ago, right? And the system always figures out a way to stay ahead. So, you know, four years ago, if you were talking about the Hunter Biden laptop story, you might've been banned from Twitter. Uh, if you tried to share it in your DMs, you know, you got shut down, all of that stuff. Facebook was deboosting it. The mainstream media was completely calling it a conspiracy theory. What was it, 70, how many uh, uh, CIA officials said it was misinformation? Was it 52? What's the famous number? Remember? It was something like 52 former three-letter agency people, front page of the New York Post, say that the Hunter Biden laptop is misinformation. Turns out to all be true, but you get it. Now the system's kind of allowing people to talk about it because they can't silence everybody at once. That's how it works. 
But there are agents of the machine, and one of the agents of the machine is Jen Psaki over at the televised mental institution known as MSNBC. And of course, she was a paid liar at the White House, and now she's just a more highly paid liar over at MSNBC. Uh, here she is defending Hunter and Joe Biden. We have to have a rule of law, Mika and Joe. It's such a relief to hear that from people, um, including when it's about, as you just said, somebody who is right. very close to the president. I mean, first and foremost, the politics of this are a little hard to predict. But right now you have the president's son, somebody he loves deeply, somebody who has very publicly struggled with dr drug addiction, now facing uh, these charges, which are serious, and I'll let Andrew do a contemplation of the legality and the process and all of that, which I know a lot of us have questions on. What is tricky yeah. to watch here, and what I think we all will be watching, is what do Republicans do with this on the Hill as it relates to their impeachment process baloney efforts, right? We didn't see a lot of that yesterday, a lot of the tying of these charges to their impeachment efforts. If there are additional charges uh, that we see from the Department of Justice that Andrew just alluded to, I suspect they would try to do that. But right now, what we're looking at, and I think on the politics of this, you know, millions of Americans have dealt with family members who have dealt with drug addiction, who've dealt with alcohol addiction, who have dealt with a range of addiction. My bet is right now this is a heartbroken president in the White House um, who is worried about his it son. Is. And we're all watching to see. It's so incredible what she's doing there. Instead of any of the impropriety and where did all of these millions of dollars magically appear in various Biden family members' accounts and why did the crack addict have the job at the Ukrainian energy company and why did Joe Biden threaten to fire the prosecutor in Ukraine who was looking into the whole freaking thing? Instead of any of that, this is about the love of the sun and the drug addict, and that there are people who drink in America. I drink because of people like her. That's really what's going on here. I, these people are such liars. And think, and what does she call it? The impeachment process baloney efforts. The impeachment process baloney efforts. Do you know that they impeached Joe, uh, Donald Trump twice, right? They went for this nonsense twice. Nobody even remembers what it was about. And if anything, they were trying to impeach him for things that Joe Biden did in the first place, collusion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But speaking of baloney, uh, here's Adam Schiff. And now this is another guy. This is a guy like Fauci who has so been wrong and lied about everything that he should be in a cave somewhere. I'm not saying we should arrest him. I think there's probably reasons that you could, or he at least broke his oath of office to defend the Constitution of the United States and things of that nature. But these are people who should be shamed into oblivion and never put on these television programs again. But they constantly get on the TV programs because they give the system just what it wants. So here's Adam Schiff on the televised mental institution known, uh, with Nicole Wallace. Uh, Nicole Wallace, who of course is she's a Democrat operative. And here they are talking about how this impeachment is complete nonsense. This is the same guy who ran two other sham impeachments. Let's get his feelings on the impeachment of his guy. I wanna ask you to contrast Mitch McConnell's declaration that quote, they nailed him, the impeachment managers of Donald Trump, with Republican House members' confession that there's zero evidence linking President Joe Biden to anything worthy of an impeachment. What do you make of the sham, uh, we try not to call it an impeachment inquiry, but a speakership clinging to by Kevin McCarthy going on in the House? Well, uh, I mean, it is such a contrast from the methodical way we went about uh, gathering the evidence in the first impeachment and the seriousness with which we took the responsibility of finding high crimes and misdemeanors um, to what we see today, which is essentially an evidence-free impeachment uh, proceeding of some kind. Guys, they were so meticulous last time. Under his name, on the Chiron, uh, it should say failed impeachment guy, right? Like why, it should say, why are we bringing this guy back on to talk about anything? Because he was so meticulous in all his impeachment stuff that nothing came of any of it, right? Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Well, here's another guy that the machine has tried to destroy repeatedly, uh, Tucker Carlson. Uh, this is him calling out Schiff six years ago, 2017. Watch this, this is fun. You're, you're, look, you're, you're on the facts. intel committee. Let me just ask you one final question. Can you look right into the camera and say, I know for a fact the government of Vladimir Putin was behind the hacks of John Podesta's Absolutely. Email. The government of Vladimir Putin was behind the hacks of our institution and the dumping of, of information. Of John Podesta's email. Not only in the of United John States, email. but also in Europe.
Okay, you're uh, not. You know what? You're dodging. And, and, and Tucker, <laughs> you, look and you say, are, "I know they did." John Podesta is even. They hacked And those. I think that uh, Ronald Reagan will be rolling oh, over Ronald his Reagan, grave. Fine. Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan. You're carrying water for the Kremlin. I'm not which, carrying water for which, the. I'm, you're you making. You look. You're a sitting member of Congress like, on the Intel uh, Committee, uh, and you can't say I, I, they hacked. Hacked. You're gonna. You're gonna have to move your show to, to RT Russian Television because. You know what? This That's is perfect, just so beneath your office because it's so dumb and you're being duplicitous. I'm asking you, did they hack Podesta's emails, and you can't say it. Sounds like that, Tucker. You're you just said I was carrying. <laughs> oh, you said I was carrying water for Putin. That's pretty well, hilarious. It, you know, when you when you essentially are an apologist for the Kremlin, that's what you're doing. I'm an apologist. One last time, Congressman. Look into the camera and say they hacked John Podesta's emails. We know for a fact that Putin's government did that. You can't, and you know you can't, and you're hiding Tucker, behind I, I, weasel words. I, I just said that the, say they Russians, hacked John the emails. Russians, I'm not going to be specific as oh, to Oh, because you don't know it. That's why. All right. Uh, Done. One. You don't know it, and you're alleging it Tucker, without any evidence. That it's you're, wrong. you're ignoring the evidence because you don't care. Uh, the fact that it, that it helped uh, the Republican candidate <laughs> is all you need to know, that's apparently. Totally it's totally false. I just think if you're going to make a serious allegation about an actual country with an actual government, you ought to know what you're talking about, and, and you and don't. Isn't that interesting how the story changes, but the tactics remain the same? That's Schiff back in 2017 saying that Tucker was carrying water for the Russians. Now flash forward to 2023 when Tucker is basically the loudest anti-war person that we have. Now, you may disagree with that. Right? You may think that we should allow Ukraine to join NATO and you th may think that we should have this giant alliance and we have to turn back Putin and we should risk World War III. People, I suppose people can make arguments about all of those things. But what do they say about the guy Tucker? Now, it's the same exact thing. You're a Putin apologist. You're carrying water for the Russians. When he's basically saying, how about we just don't march towards World War III? Uh, so it's not just about mainstream bias towards certain people. It's about the machine and how it wants to constantly control the narrative. So you are completely confused about everything all the time. And then you stop trusting the people who are approximately trying to tell you something true. And then still they put up a guy like Schiff and somebody watches it and go, my God, that Schiff's making sense. So here's another one from the televised mental institution of MSNBC. Man, we are bringing out the hits today. MSNBC brought on shamed former CNN anchor Brian Stelter. Brian Stelter, who was once the host of Reliable Sources, which as I always say, if they would have just called it Unreliable Sources, he'd probably still have a job. But he was fired because he was a promoter of the COVID nonsense. He was, promote, he was a promoter of the impeachment nonsense. Like kind of the worst of the worst. He gets fired from CNN. He ends up teaching journalism at Harvard. So let me just say, if you're an Asian kid and you can't get into Harvard these days because they're still trying to figure out ways to do affirmative action, good for you because Harvard is a cesspool of, of crapulence. Uh, it's a crapulence word. I just took that from Mr. Burns. I'm not even sure if it's an actual word. But anyway, so what does MSNBC do? They bring on the fired guy from CNN to analyze the news media when it comes to truth. This is the challenge that every journalist in America is facing. Some might want to avoid it, might want to pretend it's not a problem, might want to pretend they figured it out, but it's an incredibly hard problem to solve. Uh, this torrent of lies uh, directed at an institution that's trying to get to the truth. And mm. Ari, that's why we need this kind of coverage all the time to try to figure out the best, best path to being louder than the liars. That's our job. We are supposed mm. to be louder than the liars. Yes, Mr. Potato Head and the other guy at MSNBC, they're the ones telling you the truth. The people at MSNBC who sit there with scripts handed to them from I don't know who, who just recite talking points from the DNC. Jen Psaki, who worked at the administration and then is brought on as an analyst. Do you think she's gonna give you an honest assessment of what's going on? So what do they do? What do they do when being loud, Stelter wants to be louder. You know what I mean? He's very loud at the buffet when they run out of mac and cheese, uh, but otherwise he's not that loud. But anyway, he wants them to be louder than you, you peon. Uh, but when, they, when they're not loud enough, what's the other thing they can do? Oh, they can silence you. They can use censorship to make sure that nobody can hear you. This is a wild video. Do you remember uh, former New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern? She was during COVID, she was one of the worst of the worst. We'll censor you, stay at home. If you don't hear it from us, it's not true. I mean, this woman is a true wackadoodle. Here she is giving a speech over the weekend at the UN about free speech and why censorship is actually necessary. This week we launched an initiative alongside companies and nonprofits 
to help improve research and understanding of how a person's online experiences are curated by automated processes. This will also be important in understanding more about mis- and disinformation online, a challenge that we must, as leaders, address. Sadly, I think it's easy to dismiss this problem as one in the margins. I can certainly understand the desire to leave it to someone else. As leaders, we're rightly concerned that even the most light-touch approaches to disinformation could be misinterpreted as being hostile to the values of free speech that we value so highly. But while I cannot tell you today what the answer is to this challenge, I can say with complete certainty that we cannot ignore it. To do so poses an equal threat to the norms we all value, because for every new weapon we face, there is a new tool to overcome it. For every attempt to push the world into chaos, is a collective conviction to bring us back to order. We have the means. We just need the collective will. Does that sound scary as F or what? We have the means, we just need the collective will. We have the ways to silence the people who don't want to get injected with stuff. We have ways to make sure certain people disappear, turn off people's bank accounts, things of that nature. We just got to get the malls to do it. Are you with me? Man, that is scary. Now, speaking of people who like to shut off bank accounts of other people, uh, Justin Trudeau's got a big problem up in Canada right now, uh, which is that the people are turning against him. You know, it, it was happening during COVID and it happened during the, the trucker convoy and everything else. But now uh, Canada has a series of problems. Uh, prices for groceries have been going through the roof there. So Justin Trudeau, what does Justin Trudeau want to do? Well, he wants to threaten the people who are making the food and selling the food. Take a look. It's not okay that our biggest grocery stores are making record profits while Canadians are struggling to put food on the table. So Minister Champagne will be calling on the heads of large grocers to come to Ottawa with a plan to address the rising cost of food. And we expect to hear from them by Thanksgiving on what their plan is to stabilize prices. And it <laughs> and let me be very clear. If their plan doesn't provide real relief for the middle class and people working hard to join it, then we will take further action and we are not ruling anything out, including tax measures. Wow, evil, evil, right? We are not ruling anything out. We'll bomb all the farms if those grocers don't do what we want. Justin, do you think it has something to do with your economic policies, your big government economic policies? You know what I guarantee you won't do for everybody, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals of Canada? I know you're not gonna lower taxes on everybody. What if you lowered taxes 25% across the board? So now everyone has 25% more money. What if you got out of the way so the farmers and the grocers would be able to do, go about their business in a more sensible manner and not have to deal with so much government regulation and could grow food more easily and sell food more easily? You think that might help? But you're not gonna do any of those things. We will do anything we have to do. We will literally nuke all the chickens. Then you'll know. Just evil, just absolutely evil. But what he's really saying there, in essence, is that the government will come and take over the food chain, right? He's saying if the grocers don't do it the way we want, and we've seen this in Holland and in other countries, if the farmers don't behave a certain way, the government will come in and do everything. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? It looks like this is gonna happen in the United States too. Check out this headline. This is wild. This is happening in Chicago right now. Chicago mayor announces plans for government-run grocery stores as real stores flee shoplifters and high taxes that will apparently be used to copy the Soviet Union. As for those shoplifters, you can guess what Chicago-run store will look like. So he, this is, we know this is happening. Now remember, what happened in Chicago? Chicago had Lori Lightfoot, crazy leftist lunatic. How many people were shot in Chicago this week? Let me get some numbers on that. Uh, rampages the city, destroys it, whatever. Okay, fine. She does it. They have the highest gun, uh, the most amount of gun laws, the strictest gun policies in the country. They also have the most shootings in the country. <laughs> it's so bizarre. Bad guys don't listen to laws. I can't believe it, right? Really nuts. Uh, then what does Chicago do? They get rid of Laurie Lightfoot and they pick an even further left 
nutbag. And now the average person, and we've all seen the videos, I could, I could do a show every day. We could do a second show where every day I just show you people just looting stores in LA and San Francisco and Chicago and everywhere else, right? Uh, but the average little grocer, you have a little grocery shop, you can't operate in Chicago because guys are coming in, they're shooting you, they're stealing everything, et cetera, et cetera. Do I have numbers on the Chicago shootings this week? 18 people. 18 people shot in Chicago. Uh, one of them was a 16 year old girl. That's a, that's a little light for Chicago. All right, it must have, the weather must have been nice and people were out and about and having, having a good time. By the way, I wanna do a quick correction. You guys know I'm not above a quick correction. Uh, I said that that Jacinda Ardern video, the former New Zealand prime minister, I said that that was this weekend. Uh, that was actually last year. It's still, it fit the narrative. It doesn't change anything that I said, obviously, but that was a mistake on us. It does happen every now and again. I have no problem. Uh, correcting it, but all right, let's keep going with the narrative here. So government trying to control businesses uh, and people that kind of defend it and promote the people that are doing these things, right? There's still an awful lot of people who seem to support a guy like Justin Trudeau in Canada. And who's Justin Trudeau's butt buddy down here in the United States? <laughs> it's Gavin Newsom, you know that. So, Bill, Mar. If you're watching today, I'd like to apologize in advance, but you just dropped the ball on this one, dude, and I had to cover it. I had to cover it. Uh, here's Bill Maher. This is from his show about a week ago, complaining about Newsom, right? And he lives in California. He dealt with all the destruction, uh, complaining about Newsom, and then uh, saying that he should be president. My other question about this is, why doesn't the governor of the state of, this, of the state of California, which this is a very big business in, this is entertainment. We're like what cars are to Detroit. Why doesn't he? Or were. Jawbone. You know, jawbone, when presidents get the leaders of industries who are at odds in a room and crack their heads together well, and say- if you're running for president, why would you want to alienate the money or the most important voices? Oh, now you've opened an interesting can of worms, Mr. Gaffigan. So, first of all, you think Gavin Newsom is running for president. I think he's uh, the likely alternative. That's interesting because I remember, I like Gavin a lot. Now, I hope he runs for president because I think getting to the national stage would help with the one thing I have, a tru have trouble with him about, which is sometimes he's way too cuckoo, woke left bullshit, you know, the California well, he was shit. He was the mayor of San Francisco, right? Yeah. Bill, you, you, you're making me do. You're making me do this. What are you talking about? Gavin Newsom was the mayor of San Francisco. San Francisco is a third world country. There are drugs and crime everywhere. You guys know it. We could have showed you some B-roll of anything over the weekend of just zombie apocalypse. Gavin Newsom style in San Francisco. He then exported that to California. A million people have left California in the last three years. Uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, all the big cities crumbling. There's a massive problem related to the cities and the northern part of California where they have the actual resources, the farms and the water. There's a fight about that. Uh, none of it makes any sense. There's, you know, obviously the crime and homeless is like the easy part, but there's just like an actual cultural rot and everything else. I like Gavin and I hope he runs for president. I, I will keep trying with you, Bill, but what is going on here? What, I, I, yeah, maybe you guys see see the weakness there that I'm, I'm trying to just push him over the edge on and I, I just, I'll, I'll keep trying. But his one criticism is that he's too woke. I mean, he's literally about to sign a bill that will allow the state to take away parent, uh, children from parents because they don't affirm, which they actually by affirm, they mean unaffirm, their child's uh, gender. It, it's it's really just nuts. But okay, this is, this is the reason I wanted to show you that clip because, because then Bill does something good and gets it on something else. Uh, what Bill was referencing at the top of that was the writer's strike that's happening in Hollywood. Now, nobody really cares about the writer's strike. The, the late night shows aren't on right now. There's very little production happening in Hollywood. The writers are on strike. Now you can argue maybe they deserve more money, maybe they don't. But what's interesting is everyone's getting their entertainment elsewhere and I don't see anyone caring about it. And Bill has decided to bring back Real time, the other late night shows, uh, which are all, you know, they've all got staffs of like 20, 30 people easily on the writing staff alone. Most of them, they have staffs in the hundred in terms of lighting and sound and the rest of it and, and what's below the line and everything else. Um, but Bill is bringing real time back. So he, on one hand, 
He's like, I'm sort of for unions, right? I love Gavin, I love government and all this stuff. And then on the other hand, he's like, but you know, I wanna get back to work. And I think he's right about it. Here, here's his tweet about coming back. He said, real time is coming back. Unfortunately, sans writers or writing. It has been five months and it's time to bring people back to work. The writers have important issues that I sympathize with and I hope they are addressed to their satisfaction, but they are not the only people with issues, problems, and concerns. Despite some assistance from me, much of the staff is struggling mightily. We all were hopeful this would come to an end after Labor Day, but the day has come and gone and there still seems to be nothing happening. I love my writers, I'm one of them, but I'm not prepared to lose an entire year and see so many people below the line uh, suffer so much. I will honor the spirit of the strike by not doing a monologue, desk piece, new rules or editorial, the written pieces that I'm so proud of on real time, and I'll say it up front to the audience. The show I will be doing without my writers will not be as good as our normal show, full stop. But the heart of the show is an off-the-cuff panel discussion that aims to cut through the bullshit and predictable partisanship, and that will continue. Uh, the show will not disappoint. Okay, fine. Now, I think it's good, and I think the writers overplayed their hand, right? People just aren't clamoring for them to come back. So on one hand, he's getting it. He's getting it about unions, what unions do. The writer's union, in essence, is going to cause an awful lot of writers to never get back to work. And it's also gonna cause, when he talks about the below the line people, it's the sound people, the guy who puts the mic on, the makeup people. Why should none of them be getting paid because the writers are pissed, right? That's the, that's the struggle of, oh, we're gonna be in a union and we're gonna do what's just best for us. We don't give a shit about anybody else. Well, Bill has just kinda had enough of it. So again, he gets some things right, gets other things wrong, is what it is. Another host, I didn't even know she had a talk show, uh, but apparently Drew Barry, remember actress Drew Barry, she had, she was in E.T., wasn't she in E.T.? I don't know what else, she was in Grey Gardens, she was in E.T., a couple things over the years. Uh, she was in a couple movies with Adam Sandler. Anyway, she had, uh, or she has a talk show. Now the talk show went off because the writers were gone and then she announced that she was gonna come back because it's kind of like Bill. It's like, should I take a year off? I have other people that work for me. You know, not everybody can just survive forever. So she announces the show is coming back. The cancel machine comes for her. The everybody hates her. She's evil. So what does she do? Webcam video crying, please. I deeply apologize to writers. I deeply apologize to unions. I deeply apologize. I wanted to own a decision so that it wasn't a PR protected situation and I would just take full responsibility for my actions. I know there's just nothing I can do that will make this okay for those it is not okay with. This is bigger than me and there are other people's jobs on the line. I wanna just put one foot in front of the other and make a show that's there for people regardless of anything else that's All right, so first off, I have to issue a second correction. Her name is Drew Barry Moore, not Drew Barry. I think I was getting her confused with Drew Carey, which she's kind of morphing into him. Anyway, if you see how insane this is, she did what she thought was right, right? She did what she thought was right for herself, for the other people on her shows, their fa uh, you know, the other people that work on her show who aren't just writers, to all these other people who want to go back to work. And I have to deeply apologize. It's one thing to say I deeply apologize to the writers, right? Like that's one thing to say if you're the if you're the talent on the show, that's what they call them, the talent. You're the front facing person. I deeply apologize to I deeply apologize to the unions. That sounds that that sounds like the most sellout. I deeply apologize to the unions. There are there are vending machines in those union offices, and somebody's got to eat the Kit Kats. Like that just sounds like such a freaking sellout. Ugh. But all right, lady, they're gonna hate you no matter what you do. So, oh, so anyway, long story short, so now her show's back off. So the show was on, then it was off. She did what she thought was right. Now she's backtracking on the whole thing. Her show's off again, okay. So what is the point of showing you all this and how does this connect to everything else? These people, there is a set of people that just want to be liked more than anything else. They wanna be liked by all sides and they wanna be at every dinner and never really take a position on anything so that they can be liked and liked and liked and liked. So now let's talk about former President Donald Trump. Donald Trump went on, and I've been, look, I've been very critical of Donald Trump lately. I am getting a shit ton of hate for it. Uh, and I am just going to do what I think is right. I really am. I'm going to continue doing what I think is right. You know, I have seen some, well, I'll tell you, 
that part in just a second. Let, let's go to a video. So Donald Trump went on Meet the Press on Sunday. Now you might've noticed that on Meet the Press, they have a new host uh, this past weekend because last week, as I told you, was, uh, what's his name, Chuck Todd's last week. He took Meet the Press, in his 10 years of Meet the Press, he took it from number one Sunday morning talk show, he had left it in last shape, in, in the last in the ratings, okay? They get a new host on Meet the Press, and when I tell you that Donald Trump is part of the machine, this is exactly what I mean. Who do they get as their first guest? Donald Trump. Because Trump inflates the machine that he's constantly trying to tell you how bad it is. It's fake news NBC and CNN and New York Times, but he'll give insider access to Maggie Hamberman at the New York Times. He'll be the first guest on the newly revamped Meet the Press so that they can get good ratings while he can tell you he hates them. But anyway, one clip in particular went viral. Uh, the new, I don't even know her name. What's the new host's name? Does anyone even know? I don't know. Some chick. She's got a job. Good for her. She probably won't have it very long. Uh, she asked uh, former President Trump on his uh, feelings about abortion. And as you know, Ron DeSantis is doing the heartbeat bill here in Florida. Six weeks. A couple other states have done that. Uh, and they talked about abortion, Supreme Court, et cetera. Ch check out this answer. I want to give voters who are going to be weighing in on this election yeah. a very clear sense of where I think you stand I on this. I think they're all going to like me. I think both sides are going to like me. Let, let me what, but what's let Mr. going President, to have to Mr. happen President, is you're going to have to... This question, Kristen, please. you're asking me a question. What's going to happen is you're going to come up with a number of weeks or months. You're going to come up with a number that's going to make people happy because 92% of the Democrats don't want to see abortion after a certain period of time. If a federal ban landed on your desk if you were reelected. would you sign it at 15 weeks? Are you talking about a complete ban? A ban at 15 weeks. Well, people, people are starting to think of 15 weeks. That seems to be a number that people are talking about right now. Would you sign that? Uh, uh, I, would, I would sit down with both sides and I'd negotiate something and we'll end up with peace on that issue for the first time in 52 years. Uh, I'm not going to say I would or I wouldn't. I mean, DeSantis is willing to sign a five-week and six-week ban. Would you support that? You think that I, I goes think what he far? did is a terrible thing and a terrible mistake. There's so much there. My, my pen's going to run out of ink. Okay, first off, I'm framing this around the certain set of people that want to be liked no matter what. Listen to everything he said there. They're going to like me on both sides. I'm going to come up with a number that both sides will like on abortion. The thing that drives people, drives the wedge more than anything else. Donald Trump now, after all of these years, suddenly now he will come down Jesus-like and solve the abortion thing so that everyone will like him because that's what he cares about more than anything else. As many people like him as possible, not what's morally right or what's legally right or constitutionally right or anything like that. There's so much nonsense there. So first off, that he just frames it around that most people, that they'll all like me on this thing, right? Now, you also have to imagine that the question in and of itself is stupid because the reversal of Roe v. Wade kicked it back to the states. Now, I will give credit to Trump. He got justices on the court. If you believe in the Constitution and that states' rights matter, well, then Roe v. Wade, regardless of your feeling about abortion, was not just because there obviously was no constitutional right to an abortion, right? It's not, in, it's not something that's in the Constitution. So things that are not in the Constitution get kicked back to the state. So Trump deserves credit for the composition of the court that did the right thing. But now when he's saying, and I will come up with something that everybody will like and blah, 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 it's like, well, first off, it's, it's up to the states now. It's up to the states. It's not up to the president. So the, the idea that we're always talking about this at a national level is also just is because the people in the media, like her name, what's her name? Kristen Welker or something? It's because it's because she's misguided and confused, obviously, or or intentionally obtuse. And that Trump is even saying that, like it will not be up to the president what abortion will be. It will be up to the states. But the line that's really getting people right now is that he said that what Ron DeSantis, and the fact that he calls him DeSantis, and that, that she doesn't immediately say, why doesn't she just say, and every interviewer going forward, I would include Megan in this, and Megan did an absolutely spectacular job last week with Trump. Every time he said, why do you call him that? Why, do you, why don't you have nicknames for anybody else? Is it because you're in bed with uh, Vivek and we all kind of know it, and you know nobody else has a chance? But you, won't, you keep calling him a name, and why do you talk about him so much? Because you know he's the one that can get you. Right, you do know that. He's actually on the ground going to all 99, DeSantis I'm talking about, going to all 99 counties in Iowa, right? But, but we've already, we, we expect so little out of Trump that he, DeSantis, DeSantis, and nobody even says anything, right? Like, are, are we, do we want to be third graders forever or do we want to be adults? Well, I know what I want to be, but what do you want to be? 
That's really the question here. Um, but, but that he calls the heartbeat bill terrible is really interesting because look, I personally, I've written about this, I've discussed it many times, I've debated it with Ben Shapiro, and with Dennis Prager. Personally, Florida had a 15 week ban, right? That's, that's a little more than three months. Uh, it's before the fetus can feel pain. And in a society where we're gonna have a pluralistic set of views and, and philosophies and religions and all of those things, it was a compromise. Ron DeSantis did not lie. He had always said he was pro-life and he has a super majority here and he decided to push forward with this six week heart, uh, heartbeat thing. Now you may be for it or against it, but the, but Trump as the pro-life guy, the, 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 the base loves, he's the most pro-life president ever, right? Like he's probably paid some women for abortions, but okay, put that aside even for a second. Um, he's, he's supposed to be Mr. Pro-life and he calls it terrible. I, it was the word terrible that I saw that really pissed off people, that, the, that banning abortion at the heartbeat, that that somehow is terrible, is an odd thing. Now, I'm not even for it, right? This is, the I think, the one issue that I have a, a real difference with DeSantis on. I was okay with our 15-week thing here in Florida. To me, 15-week is what every, every moderate Democrat of 20 years ago would have said about three months, about 15 weeks is the right thing, right? Some people would have said 20. At 20, they, they know that the fetus can feel pain. And now that, now that science is actually advancing in this type of stuff, they're learning it's a little bit earlier and earlier. The point is nobody's, the only absolute position you can have on this is the second the sperm meets the egg, when no woman knows she's pregnant, that at that point she cannot have an abortion. Most people don't feel that. And I think Trump in some ways is campaigning for the general more than he's campaigning for the Republican nomination. He's also afraid of stepping on stage with DeSantis, so that kind of proves that right there. But this sort of thing, that at the end, what's he, uh, everyone will love me. I will say the thing that everyone will love. Is it true? Is it based on anything or anything else? This is a real problem. I bring this up because everyone, including Trump, and I can probably suffer from it from some extent, and, and I am seeing so many people right now that are completely captured by their own audiences right now. After the horrible answer that Trump gave to Megyn Kelly when he couldn't say whether a man can turn into a woman, he couldn't just immediately say no. He had to stammer through it, right? This thing, that this, the heartbeat bill is terrible. These answers, the, the inability to say, I screwed up with Fauci, I screwed up with lockdowns, like all of that, I deserve more credit with COVID. Everyone is captured by their audience. And the second you're captured, but not everyone, many people are captured by their audience and it can happen to anyone. I am trying to fight that very hard by not being captured by my audience. So I have a lot of you pissed at me because of my feelings about Trump right now. But I, I'm talking now to the, to the conservative set of people who are supposed to be the deep truth tellers and they're gonna call balls and strikes and all that stuff. Why is it nobody's playing the clips of Trump on Megyn Kelly? Why is it that everyone went silent on that little piece that we just showed you right there about the heartbeat bill. Because they are afraid that if they say anything against Trump or the base, as Charlie Kirk told me, if they say anything against it, they will be destroyed. I just will not play that game and it might cost me clicks and views and money and everything else, but I'm going to do what I think is right. But audience capture, I think Trump is suffering from it. I think the pundits are suffering from it. And I, and I can see why it's an easy trap door that any of us could get caught in. So what is the segue that brings us back to the beginning? The segue is be a dissident. Be a dissident like Russell Brand. Be an ex-Hollywood rebel. Be someone who fights the system. Be someone who maybe had a messy past that is living uh, an honest, truthful today. And if you do that, I just think over time we can correct this ship. Don't be someone that never can say that they screwed up in the case of Donald Trump. Don't be someone that can never have a mea culpa or show some kind of contrition. Don't be someone that just endlessly gives to the machine. Who cares if everyone doesn't love you? You guys aren't gonna believe this. There are some people that don't like me. They're out there, okay? They don't like me, it's okay. It really is okay. Truth should matter more. Truth should matter more. And how will the system treat you? Just one or two more for you. This is a tweet from the Telegraph. How will the system treat you if you, if you say those scary things? This is from the Telegraph yesterday. Russell Brand climbed the Hollywood ladder while ra railing against the capitalist elite. But all he's after is whatever serves his ego and wallet. How bizarre that they're writing that headline just as all of the other stuff is coming. Do you think it's coordinated? Do you think they'd been working on this piece for a long time to take him out? 
Do you think, do you think guys, can you see it? One more, Russell Brand, a couple of years ago, go. Provide alternative narratives and not only provide the narratives, invite you to create the narratives with us. Because do you know one thing I know? I don't know what's best. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've been wrong many times, but I'm beginning to think I'm right about this. The mainstream media is not your friend. The culture is not your friend. The government is not your friend. Big business is not your friend. All right, look, so we're gonna be in a time where they can come after everybody. I get it, they could come after me. So it's time I had a mea culpa of my own. In third grade, this is totally true, guys. In third grade, I was into He-Man. He-Man was huge back then, around 1984, something like that. Uh, Skeletor, obviously, was the main guy going after He-Man. And I had Skeletor, but I lost his staff. We find out what the name of Skeletor's staff was. It had like a little, like a horn, like a horn or a ram's head on it. I think it had a name, his staff. I lost his staff. It came with a staff. Uh, one day I went to my friend Chad. Chad W., you know who you are. I went to Chad's house and Chad had, it was called the Havoc staff. Thank you. Chad had the Havoc staff. And Chad didn't really care about He-Man. He was into sports a little bit earlier than I was. I was still doing my He-Man G.I. Joe Transformers thing. And I, uh, I stole the staff. I stole the Havoc staff from Chad. Chad W., you know who you are. We live two blocks away. Used to ride your bike to my house all the time. And I just want to get ahead of this thing because I know they're coming for me. I apologize. And, uh, you know, Chad, if there's ever anything I can do for you, we're going to send this clip to you. If you ever need help, a little cash, get out of a bind. You want me to promote something? I don't know what you're doing. I don't know where you live. I don't know what's going on with you. We lost touch. But I hope you're doing all right, Chad. Guys, it's me Monday over at the Ruben Report Locals community. Here's the one that I put up. When you buy your John Fetterman costume from Wish, look at all of the John Fettermans that you can be. By the way, I want to cover this story tomorrow. We didn't even get to it today. But uh, Chuck Schumer has now put new rules in at the house where they don't have to dress any particular way anymore. Men used to have to dress basically in suits and ties. Uh, and women had to be in, I think they called it business, business casual attire or something like that. They are throwing all the rules out. And it's like, we are going to have no standards anymore. It's gonna, we're going to literally have people dressing up as clowns and trans robots and everything else. I don't mean transformers, like trans, like you get it, you get it. Anyway, if you wanna join us for the post game show, it's coming up right now at rubenreport.locals.com. Oh, and by the way, over the weekend, we put up an interview uh, with a lady by the name of Sonia Shaw. She is the woman, we played a clip of her last week in Chino, California. She's the head of the school board there who they were fighting to kick out this gender nonsense from uh, their, their classrooms in Chino, California, because there are a couple sane people in Cali remaining. And the state superintendent uh, from Sacramento came on down to try to shut her down. She kicked him out. It's, it's a whole brouhaha happening in Chino right now. You can check that out on Rumble and on uh, Locals, of course, and YouTube. Post game show in just a second. We leave you with Nancy Pelosi, who's running again, 847 years old. She just wants to save the children. Hello, it's Nancy. Thank you for giving me the privilege to represent our city and our San Francisco values in the Congress and amplifying the voice of the big dark money in politics. That is my why, why I am in Congress, for the big dark money. This is my story and this is my song. As you hear me say, when you're in the arena, you have to be able to punch the children. And that is why I am running for re-election to Congress and respectfully seek your support. I would be greatly honored by it and grateful for it. Thank you so much.